So hello everyone and what a great audience. This is a, a real treat. Thank you all for being here to share this beautiful evening together to support the arts, our community of artists, and especially printmaker and painter Willa Cox. Willa's artistic inspiration comes from, among other areas, the qualities of water, earth, atmosphere, light, and vegetation, which she remembers from her childhood in Hawaii, or that she experiences, experiences in New York, where she resides with her painter, photographer, husband. About five years ago, Willa began to create one-of-a-kind books, sequencing related images and offering them in the accordion book format you see today in her abstract narratives exhibit. And presenting imagery in this fashion allows Willa to expand the narrative within each sequence. And even though time is usually arrested forever in a painting, we can read across the multiple panels as if we were actually able to inhabit the painted spaces. Each artist brings to MGFA their unique and eloquent statement and one of the many rewards which we enjoy as gallery owners is an expanded opportunity to explore the artwork. But we can only guess at the intricate processes and techniques and marvel at the outcomes. So to help dispel any lingering mysteries and enlighten us all, we turn to the artist herself and it is our great pleasure to introduce our friend and featured artist, Willa Cox. Thank you everyone. I so appreciate that you're all here tonight. One day, a long, long time ago, I was an undergraduate at the University of Hawaii studying painting and the phone rang. My grandmother had suddenly been taken to the hospital. Now I was raised with a strong sense of filial responsibility. And I was her only family member on the island. So right away I knew it was my responsibility to visit her every day. But it was a long trip to the hospital and would have meant no time for painting. And that's the first time I faced that painful question of where would I give my energy, to painting or the rest of life? I see people nodding. I think most of us have experienced that. And it so often feels like an either or. But in my experience, I found that with thought and creativity, being there for my family has sometimes led to unexpected discoveries in my painting. And vice versa, that decisions I made to further my life as a painter wound up having unexpected personal benefits. I'm gonna give you some examples. So in that instance, I came up with a compromise. I'd send her a handmade card every day, visit once a week. Her hospital stay turned into a nursing home stay that went on for like three months, so I needed a lot of cards. <laughs> <laughs> and so I decided to make them quickly. I would randomly cut up one of my less successful paintings on paper into rectangles that would fit on pieces of folded paper. And I expected like, you know, some interesting color splotches that would work for a greeting card. But to my surprise, delight, but also considerable, considerable dismay, I found some of those randomly created compositions more interesting and more successful than anything I'd done on purpose. That <laughs> <laughs> <I> was rough. <laughs> and that idea of random creation versus deliberate creation came to mind when I read the first paragraph of Jed Pearl's recent book, Authority and Freedom. He writes, Authority and freedom are the lifeblood of the arts. Whether reading a novel, looking at a painting, or listening to music, we are feeling the push and pull of these two forces as they shape the creator's work. Authority is the ordering impulse. Freedom is the love of experiment and play. 
they coexist, they compete. What I discovered when I saw how much I liked those random compositions was the importance of freedom, play, and experiment in my work. And I've cut up quite successfully several paintings since then. <laughs> <laughs> and I've embraced processes that include experiment and play. And my grandmother, she loved those cards. <laughs> she recuperated, she crocheted an afghan in the colors of her favorite one. And when she died, she didn't leave a lot, but we found those cards, oh. carefully bundled and saved. Mm -hmm. And those cards came to mind when I started working on these 14 panel works. When I realized these individual panels are just about the same size as those images for those cards. And it's the first time I've done anything on this small a size since then. It was a very long time ago. But before I tell you more about how I make my work, I'd like to tell you about a few other decisions that I made to create and sustain my life as a painter and how those decisions worked out. I grew up in Hawaii, a place that I loved and still love dearly. As a child, I spent a lot of time at the beach. Beach combing, shell collecting was a passion, exploring tidal pools, swimming, snorkeling, and walking across the reefs at low tide at night with a flashlight and nets to collect fish for our tropical aquarium. As I got older, I liked to climb on a rocky coastline high above the ocean with a friend. We'd go to the highest spot and look mm -hmm. down and watch the waves crash against the rocks below us into caves and then spew their foam out into the sea. I also love the mountains, hiking off into waterfalls, mudsliding on tea leaves down wet hillsides, <laughs> and swimming in clear mountain pools. I loved so much about Hawaii, the culture, the music, the food, the legends, the landscape, and most of all, my friends. But when I went to graduate school and start, started studying contemporary art and the art of the past in greater depth, I longed to see more of it than I could see in Honolulu. I dreamt about living near the museums and galleries of New York City. But that seemed like an impossible dream and a very scary place until I visited fell in love with the city, and moved. And when I first arrived, and people learned I was from Hawaii, they'd often say, well, you left Hawaii for this. <laughs> 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 or they'd say, are you experiencing culture shock? <laughs> I really liked New York culture, right from the get-go, as we say. Uh, but I was experiencing what I call nature shock, which felt like a very painful loss of nature. And so I started painting nature, which was really funny, uh, because all those years surrounded by glorious inspiration, I never painted it in Hawaii. I was motivated by my need for it, and eventually by my delight in the new forms of nature I was experiencing in New York, especially with the change of seasons. And ultimately, my work also came to be about my memories of Hawaii. Not of particular places or landscapes, but of aspects. The mountains, waterfalls, vegetation, rock, volcanic explosion, the ocean, and the sky. And sometimes, in these 14 panel pieces, all of that's in one piece. So by moving to New York, I not only spent a lot of time in the museums and galleries, but I found my subject matter, because I'm still painting that subject matter. And I found my husband, Jeffrey <laughs> Salmon. 
And that is my best example of an unexpected personal positive impact <laughs> based on something I did through my painting. <laughs> on our first date, our conversation followed the general outlines of this talk. Our bios. We do on a first date. What we were painting, how excited we were about it, and that burning question for people starting their careers. How in the world do you make a living in New York City and have time and energy for your creative work? And this is what we came up with. Soon after we met, Jeffrey got a job at the Frick Art Reference Library as a cataloger. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I got an entry level position at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And these institutions, they gave us our education and continuing inspiration. <coughs> a new way to contribute to the arts and generous amounts of time off, most of which we spent making our work. We rented a two bedroom house in Astoria, Queens. And soon the living room became subdivided into Jeffrey's photo studio and my print room. The larger of the two bedrooms became my painting studio and the basement became Jeffrey's painting studio and workshop. Fortunately, we have an eat-in kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> we carefully looked at all the routines and rituals of life, the things you take for granted, the things couples do, the things families do, to, to decide whether they really supported us in making our work. And we found many of them didn't, like planning to eat all our meals together and celebrating all the holidays, which get in the way of a lot of studio time and don't have to. And so we made adjustments. And to me, that shaping of our lives, which is ongoing, is a creative act in itself. We learned how important it is to spend some time every day on our creative work, even if it's just a little time. Because those little bits of time accrete. And while you're not working, your mind's processing what you've done. And that fresh look the next morning always tells you something new. And as we got older, it became more important to give our best energy to our work my best energies in the morning. So for my last 15 years at the Met, I woke up every morning at 4.30 so that I could paint before I went into the museum. And around that time, Jeffrey was having a lot of success in the gallery world. And I was enjoying my painting and my job at the museum. And we decided we wanted to have more studio time, both of us. So we decided Jeffrey should leave his position at the Frick to paint, to paint full time. Being cautious people, we carefully made sure we could live on my salary before we did that. But we found we could, and it involved, of course, serious frugality, but it was not hard in the service of something so important to us. And when we did, Jeffrey took over almost all of our home and life maintenance. And we were both surprised at how much more time and energy I had for my work, even while holding what had become a very responsible position at the Met. The most significant recent addition to how I've created my life as a painter is that for the past two and a half years, I have been Zooming with a wonderful group of artists from ZMA's printmaking. Hmm. And they have contributed to many of these 14 panel pieces, which I've done in that time period, by their very insightful comments to works in progress. And by tools and techniques I've learned from them. For instance, gel monotype. So now I'd like to tell you more about how I make my work, the nuts and bolts. This is the earliest piece in this exhibition. I did it about 20 years ago. It's part of a large body of work that I call nature-based abstraction. 
And to make this piece and others like it, I start with a heavyweight piece of paper on which I glue collage elements. In this piece, I made the collage elements using marbling, which is in this area, and this here, and here, and monotype. And there's a lot of small bits of monotype, which you're not going to be able to see from where you are, but they're here, and up here, and probably other places. In other pieces in the same body of, of work, I have used a lot of other processes. There's um, wax resist in the piece behind, right where the videographer is standing at the top of that piece. Thank you, Philip. And there's embossment and cut paper and torn paper in many of the pieces, and especially you'll see it in that blue one there, and in the two large pieces at the end of the, actually the beginning of the exhibition gallery. I'm open to just about any process on paper. And I also like to use a wide variety of kinds of papers of different absorbance and weight and texture and color. And that rich variety of materials and processes and papers, to my eye, evokes the richness of nature. And there's a seamlessness to nature that I also want to evoke. And so I sand down the edges of all the collage elements and smooth them over with modeling paste so that the piece is seamless across. When I begin to paint on the piece and I use an acrylic gouache, um, I, I find and create relationships and gradually a composition emerges. In this piece I also used a lot of charcoal and drawing to integrate the various parts. When I started working this way, I limited my palette to black and white. It was like all I could deal with to, to manage all these different processes and integrate them, and I wanted just to focus on that. But once I became comfortable with my new technique, I introduced a mixed gray made of red oxide, yellow ochre, and ultramarine blue. Nice. And at first I really worked with it just as a gray, but then I let those colors become more assertive and then very assertive. And they're still very important in my palette. Uh, but I gradually expanded the palette to the full range that you see here. But for instance, this one is just a little bit of other yellows in addition to those, those tones. And that one too is basically the red oxide and yellow ochre. Before any piece is finished, or before I consider it finished, I invite Jeffrey into my studio. We've come to know each other's work very well over the years, and I trust his eye, and sometimes I feel like he understands it better than I do. There's, there's a distance, you know, that I can't have. And he's given me some really marvelous suggestions. I don't take all the suggestions I get from ZMAs or Jeffrey, but when they agree. <laughs> yeah. So after I'd been working for a while on this scale, 30 by 22, I had a lot of work. I did several years I worked in this way. I had a lot of work. And as you might imagine, some pieces were more successful than others. And so remembering the lesson of my grandmother's cards, I decided to cut the less successful ones into quarters and start over using them as the starting material for 15 by 11 inch pieces, which are those pieces there. And I developed them in the same way that I developed these. And the new thing with those, that's the smallest size I'd worked on for a very long time. And I really uh, loved the intimacy of being able to hold them in my hands while I was thinking about them. And I wanted the viewer to have that experience of my work, to be able to hold it with no glazing. And so I decided to present my work in books. And I chose the accordion format because the pages lie completely flat and the books can open out like a folding screen. And I've loved Japanese folding screens for years. 
And my, the book in the entryway below my name is my first book. I made the pieces in that book as standalone pieces, but I found that group of eight related to each other as a sequence, and since it was going to open out like a folding screen, they had to. And that was a big discovery. I loved sequencing. And so I worked in that manner uh, for some time with other books. And at that time, Petey gave me a great idea. She said, have you ever thought of working smaller? And that idea really appealed to me. And so I, I cut up some of my monotype sketches into equally sized rectangles, which are the size of these pieces. And I laid them out and just trying to think about the number, the best number of panels. And 14 just looked right to me. <laughs> Completely intuitive decision. Mm -hmm. But when I expanded the number from 8 to 14, suddenly I had room enough to create a real narrative with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and development. Whether it's from black and white, as in that piece over there, to color and back, or different kinds of terrain in this piece, or different perspectives, looking from above, looking from inside, looking down. And sometimes the same area can shift from appearing to be a mountain to appearing to be water, and, and, it, and different people have different interpretations, and I really like that and want that. And that's why I've called them abstract narratives. I begin this work usually with a single panel that speaks to me and seems to lead somewhere that I think I'd like to go. I have so many of these panels now. I, I made them pretty much the way I made my grandmother's cards. They're mostly cut up monotypes. Um, those first three black and white ones are from rep a series of representational monotypes that I made. Or marbling, there's a fair amount of marbling. For instance, that's a classic piece of marbled paper. Watercolors. So I, I choose a single panel. I don't know where it's going to leave me. But then I just start moving panels in and out until I achieve some kind of narrative. And then I build on it. And I take a fair amount of time on each sequence. And panels, I move panels in and out a lot sometimes rotate them, um, and I paint over them to strengthen the flow, strengthen the narrative I see. And I want there to be a flow, but I also want there to be the pleasure of the occasional surprise. <laughs> and that brings me back to the Jed Pearl quote that I read at the beginning of my talk. I find order in making this work in the consistent number of evenly spaced panels with a progression running through them. And I find the opportunity for experiment and play in the way I make the panels, in the surprising developments in the progression, and in the sometimes bracing transitions between them. And when I started out this work, I thought they'd all be books, like that one there, and the one in the entry. But one day, Jeffrey and I were looking at them, and I always spread them out as a sequence while I was making them to see how they were. And he said, I think you should frame some of these. <laughs> and that immediately made sense for the same reason that I made the books. I wanted the viewer to have the experience we were having. And so I decided to frame the more panoramic sequences that seem best taken in all at once. Mm -hmm. And to bind into books the more intimate sequences that seem to me best experienced either page by page or in the accordion format. And it is incredibly satisfying for me to see this work together in this beautiful space. And I thank Petey and Jim for that and for so many things. 
and most of all, for your belief in my work, which means the world to me. And I thank all of you for your interest in my work and for what I've, and, and what I've had to say. Thank you.